Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters. Our guest is Charles Jensen. We're going to talk about the banking system and how it's a ticking time bomb. This is very important to get to the fundamentals of our society and evaluate. It's a time for evaluation. It's a time for reform, for correction. And uh, Charles, who is an engineer, will help us do that. Welcome to the show, Charles Jensen. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me. Uh, to get all the details of what we're about to talk about, pick up my book, The Big Solution, uh, Deactivating Ticking Time Bomb of Today's uh, Economy. And uh, yeah, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the changes we need to actually uh, get to the next stage of, uh, of society, of evolving society. And the banking system is the fundamental problem we face today. Okay, let's talk about the problem before we talk about the solution. What is the problem? With the banking system? Well, fundamentally, the banking system hasn't evolved in uh, about 110, uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, the, the, the basic principles of our banking system were put in place uh, in 1913 uh, with the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. And this is where uh, the banks uh, basically created or bought the rights to money creation from the federal uh, government. Uh, and, and there's a, a story behind it, uh, JP Morgan, that JP Morgan, uh, the largest bank in America, bailed out the federal government in 1907. And six years later, uh, uh, as, a, as a direct cause of that, the uh, banks uh, created the Federal Reserve. It's a private corporation where they can print money. And then the, uh, the, the banks like JP Morgan can actually use that printed money to make loans uh, to uh, businesses and people, mortgages and so on. And that is the fundamentals of how our banking system and our finance system works. That money is fundamentally credit. Was there a time that it did work? Well, you know, initially there was the gold standard and the gold standard created uh, quite a lot of restriction behind money printing because you could only print as much money uh, as you had in gold. And so there, it was it was kind of uh, constraining, and that worked for a while, uh, but, but basically up until uh, you know World War II and the Great Depression, and they started very quickly, uh, even in uh, just after World War One, but right in that range between World War One and World War Two, they started doing. Um, uh, basically, where they did not have to reserve as much gold as they had issued in credit. So ba it's basically, it became a fractional reserve. And now that expanded the money supply and which helped grow the economy. Well, uh, you know, move forward to Nixon. Nixon realized that, uh, or under Nixon, uh, he was put under a lot of pressure because foreign governments were uh, flooded with US dollars and they started buying gold. Uh, in order to, uh, in, for dollars, or they took the dollars that they earned and bought gold. And the United States was losing all the money in Fort Knox. And Nixon said, wait a minute, I don't want to lose all the gold. So I'm not going to sell any more gold, which basically decoupled the dollar from gold. And from there, you had the massive inflation of the late 70s and early 80s, where Volcker, Volcker came in and jacked up the rates to 18, whatever, 20%, very high rates, and basically crushed uh, the economy because nobody wanted to take out a loan or expand credit supply with that kind of interest rate. And what that did was it put the, the inflation of in society put that on the backs of the working man. Inflation was no longer controlled by gold. Now the working man was the control for inflation. So anytime the economy cooks up a little bit like it is right now, it's kind of hot. What do they do? They raise interest rate, reduce the money supply. And guess who bears the brunt of it? All the people who get fired because the economy has to slow down in order to control inflation. Now, well, that, that's problematic in and of itself, but when you get into it, the real fundamental problem is that money, because banks control money supply, is defined as credit. J.P. Morgan himself said, and he's quoted as saying, money is either gold or credit, and everybody still, still believes that today. And the problem is, it's false. You know, and the reason is, as an engineer, 
I know that there's something called first principles. First principles are like the laws of thermodynamics. They're universal rules and laws of the universe that are always true, no matter what, even for dollars and economics and banking systems. Fundamental principles of the universe are just true always. So when JP Morgan said that uh, money is either gold or credit, he was wrong because it is that is not true according to the laws of the universe according to the laws of the universe information which is what money is right and how do i know money is information we know that because on the serial uh on every dollar bill there's a serial number that serial number goes into a database or is controlled by a database at the federal reserve so in other words money is tracked by a serial number information so, and we also can see it in action right we can we can wire money across the world data across the world you can uh, um, you know basically digitally create money everywhere and then we learn that from cryptocurrencies that it's just information but, so here's the problem and here's that prince that universal principle that needs to be applied so we can start engineering the financial system and that is this everything in the universe is engineerable in other words you can control the variables into a process to create the outcomes you want this is how we create better cars computer systems anything that is engineered this is the fundamental principle that is being used we control the inputs into a process and we could and we can therefore can control the outputs this is the fundamental principle the problem with our economy and the banking system and the global economy is that the only input into our financial system is credit and that causes a very specific type of work to be done and only that type of work that that work that has to be done has to be credit worthy if it's not credit worthy banks won't loan the money and that work doesn't get done well we know from our own households that there's a problem with not doing the work that has to be done for example nobody pays me to clean my house if nobody pays me to clean my house then why should i do it well if i don't do it what happens garbage piles up the sinks full of uh, dishes all of a sudden it becomes toxic and all of a sudden if i keep living in my house i'm going to die it's just not livable anymore well think about our planet well why is it we can't clean up the oceans from all the plastic and pollution and why is it we can't clean up our atmosphere from all the uh, carbon dioxide and pollution in the atmosphere same reason there's no money in it in other words the banking system prevents us from doing the work we need to do let me and jump in all... let me jump in so yeah. the, he was wrong when he said it's only gold or credit no but, but see what here's is, the thing what he's is the not fundamental principle that is right what is the fundamental engineering concept that we have to see here in order to understand the problem and thus create the solution what what is that principle that principle is that um, money is credit or gold if you're a banker. That's what money is to a bank, no doubt about it, right? However, money is also information, and information can be anything. Information can be money wired across the internet, or money can. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry, so you're saying stop looking at it the way he looked at it. Correct. Because the way he looked at it was from a banker's point of view. And this is- So incorrect. we should look at it as information. Yes, and information we can do anything we want with. And then we apply the rules of engineering, engineering processes, and we can control the money supply. That's what it is, right? We can control the money supply, but we can also start fixing the environment. We can start uh, increasing, uh, you know, how much it, uh, it costs uh, or how much, how much money people earn. We can also, through engineering, control the cost of living. Today, the cost of living is out of control. Engineering allows us to apply principles that can reduce the cost of living going forward. Okay, which is well, let's start, let's start with the, the, the money supply and we'll yeah. go to the other guy. I like to understand sure. the relationship. So the money supply, it's information. So somewhere, uh, and I'm thinking computer programming, you, you say engineering, but I think it's really computer programming. When you're dealing with, that, with information, it's information technology, right? So, Correct. okay, I have a little black box, okay? Yeah. And this black box is gonna control my money supply. And we'll get to other, other 
you know, control points later. But um, how, what do I put into the box and what do I take out of the box? How does the box affect my society? What instructions is it giving my society so that uh, everybody buys into the money supply as established by the little black box? Well, today, money supply is a very consistent, actually. It's at about a trillion dollars. Uh, so money is uh, paid towards debt and money is, uh, is given out as debt. And so basically, there's this constant uh, coming and going of money, creating a pretty consistent $1 trillion in the money supply. Uh, and it's all done through credit payments or, or credits being paid out. Uh, so when we understand money as information, well, then there's a whole bunch of new ways of controlling the money supply. And through engineering and logic, you can understand and look at the society as a whole, and you see all of a sudden all of these opportunities to improve efficiencies and improve society and improve outcomes, which is what we don't have today. We don't have any way of controlling outcomes. This is why they're always saying, well, what's the economy going next? Who knows, right? Because there is no control over our economy. I totally agree. But what, you know, yeah. what, 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 what comes out the other side? Suppose you put in lots of data about how things are how things are doing, you know, selected data, if you will, um, and what comes out the other side is it is it interest rates? Uh, is it the gee? I don't, what would it be in order to rationalize the whole system and do it better than the banks do? Right. Well, we look at the very big inefficiencies in society today, and the biggest inefficiencies today is actually. Uh, the social safety net. Three quarters of the federal government, the federal government spending, so you're talking about $3 trillion approximately, is towards safety nets. This is a tremendous amount of money and it's highly inefficient. And, and, and But on top of that, you've got states and cities spending on top of that on, on uh, homeless shelters and you know food banks. The spending is unbelievable. Why is the spending so great on safety nets? Because it's, it's I, I, I go to the home situation because people can usually relate to that. Well, if I have, you know, if I have five kids and I say, well, nobody's paying me to take care of my kids, so I'm not going to take care of them. And then what do you do? Well, you hope for the kids sake that the government steps in and take, starts taking care of the kids. You know, to, I don't know, bringing them to somewhere to get food and take care of them. Well, that's exactly what happens in our society. Society today. Well, their economy isn't taking care of the poor. So, well, who's going to take care of the poor? Well, I guess the government's going to have to take care of the poor. And that's exactly what happens. What we want is an economy that takes care of the poor, where everybody's included. So how do you do that? How do you do that efficiently, way more efficiently? And it's easy to be more efficient than, have you ever been uh, uh, interrail in Europe or cross country traveling? The amount of money you actually need to live on a daily basis is very little, like five, 10 bucks. You can actually get by, right? Today, the, the city of um, San Francisco spends 25,000, this is just the city of, 20, uh, of San Francisco, spends $25,000 per homeless person in that city per year. So it adds up to you know, billions of dollars. The spending on, on uh, safety nets is incredible and it's incredibly wasteful. So uh, fundamentally you understand that if you have multiple ways of injecting money into the system and pulling money back out of the system, and we can talk about both sides of the equation in your black box scenario, that the first and most important principle is actually getting rid of the safety nets and just making sure that everybody in the world has five bucks a day to, to spend, because this way they can get the food they need and they can get the shelter they need if the economy is structured around that scenario. How do, you, the, how do you feel about Andrew Yang? Remember him? Well, uh, okay, so now this is the mistake that everybody does when they first start reading my, my books and principles. They say, oh, you're talking about basic income. It's not basic income. It's very different because money that comes from the Federal Reserve is printed. It's printed out of thin air. Nobody owes. It's not credit. It's money, but it's information. It's not credit. You see, the problem with basic income is it's credit. 
either the federal government has to borrow the money or the you know whoever is issuing the basic income has to borrow it from somewhere and this is the fundamental problem with the banking system that money can only exist as credit now as soon as you realize hey money's just information and we can issue money to solve so social problems, societal problems, well then, oh, wow, boom, I just solved poverty, something they say that will never be solved. In fact, as long as the banking system controls the money supply, poverty will never be solved because it's cooked into the system. Poverty has to exist because otherwise they couldn't control inflation. This is what they're doing right now by raising interest rates and, and doing reverse um, quantitative easing. I, I, I'm, I'm with you, Charles, but yeah. you know, I, I, I don't know how this family, the hypothetical family, the case study, if you will, yeah. um, how, how are they cared for? Uh, say five kids, that might have been a mistake to have as many as five kids. Um, he doesn't have a job that will support that, but we don't want him to be poor. And we want to have this new banking system that you're talking about, this new money system you're talking about, actually take care of him so he is not poor. Um, isn't it Andrew Yang where you give him a, a guaranteed income um, or is it a is it something that is calculated by the black box um, I, and what I get so far and you can correct me if it's not in line with the book um, is that you know we have a federal system where the federal government for political reasons gives money away when you know when people are squawking about poverty and, and homelessness and the like we have state systems in 50 states that give money away uh, for also political reasons in those states. And we have duplication of effort, redundancy all over the board. We have irrational inconsistencies uh, between the programs in state to state and state to federal. Um, and there's a lot of money dropping through the cracks that is wasted. I get it. I, I, and, I, and I'm thinking Absolutely. this black box is it's about six inches square. And it, it so makes right. critical decisions that affect uh, everyone everywhere. And yeah. it makes them on the basis of all the considerations that would apply to federal and state. And you take the politics out of it. It's mechanical. It's engineered. Yes. It's, it's engineered. Programmed. Yes. Okay. So the question is, how does my, my family, uh, where the fellow doesn't have much of a job, and, and uh, maybe his wife works, maybe not, and there are five children, what does the black box do for them to keep them out of poverty? Well, first of all, several million kids go to bed uh, with not enough food every night in the United States. So whatever we're doing right now, the food stamps, whatever, it isn't working, right? There are kids that are losing out on their potential because they're not eating enough in the richest country in the world. So think about all the other countries in the world where it's much, much worse. But even in America, millions of kids every night. Now, well, first of all, we have to understand that if the kids are getting $5 a day, that is actually enough money for a nutritious meal. So how a kid doesn't have $5 in today's society to, to get a decent meal is, is just mind boggling. So yeah, if you're poor and you're deciding not to work, yeah, you're going to have to work just to take care of yourself. But that's the key thing here is that there's so many people in homeless shelters, uh, you know, on unemployment lines or on welfare, you name it, whatever safety net you want to call it, that are perfectly capable of taking care of themselves. And, and this, is, this is really the problem. We don't want government doing anything, period. But especially, we don't want them taking care of us because that's a double-edged sword, right? It might be great when you get that welfare check, but all of a sudden, you've got Ted Cruz saying, hey, before you get that check, you got to you know, pee in this cup or you got to do something else for me because I'm paying you. Meanwhile, it isn't, the, it isn't the poor people's fault. It's the economy that doesn't work correctly because the banking system has the reins, the controls to the economy, but they don't know how to use them. So we've basically out of control economy doing who knows what, going who knows where, for what purpose, none right? Because we're literally in a car going faster and faster because the economy has to keep growing without a steering wheel. We can head off a cliff into, you know, 
some kind of dystopian future, or we can head into a wall with global warming or pollution in our food supply. In other words, we can't control, we have no way of knowing or where we're going. But one thing's for sure, if you're in a car that's going faster and faster, eventually you're going to crash if you don't have a steering wheel. There's just oh, no I, way around. I agree. I think that's, we we're seeing that now and, and the cliff isn't that far away. But <clears throat> let me ask you, if, if, I, if I made you Congress, Jarl, Mm -hmm. And president, both. Yeah. Okay, what, what I'd solve, I'd I'd solve the world's problem in like a month. What, what I'd would, literally, I'd, I'd know exactly what to do. It's what, in my book, what, too. What would it look like? What would the bill look like? The statute? If, I think I could get away. Well, if, if I could control Congress, but especially with presidential powers, mm -hmm. you can literally do an executive action to go into Federal Reserve because it's a corporation. With, Fed, with executive action, you can literally change a single document. It's called monetary policy, which has been essentially the same for over 100 years. You change monetary policy away from this credit principle and into information and, and engineering society Boom, it's a brand new world and our troubles are now solvable. And I, I can tell you how to solve global warming, pollution in the oceans. We can solve all our problems if we get rid of our current monetary policy in the Federal Reserve. Okay, what, what, what would it say though? You, you wanna make a change. What, what exactly would it say in the change? Well, in my book, The Big Solution, <laughs> there it is. Um, I do, I, I can- You wanted I have, to buy the book to know the change? No, well. <laughs> It is, it is, I think by reading the book, and it's, it's a bit of a long book, but it does explain to everybody how we got here, the history behind it, uh, but also all the problems it's causing right now, from poverty to pollution. There's so many problems, and it shows the reader how it's solvable, why it's solvable, and why it's not really complicated to think about. It's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story so everybody can understand it. What, what is the change? What is the magic change? that I need to do to get rid of the, the burdens of the existing banking system and go on to a, a moral, efficient system, economic system, economy in the, in the United States. And so it's to solve these problems. There's gotta be one core point, one executive order, as you were talking about the you know, monetary policy or Congress has to pass a bill, which Congress has trouble doing these days, especially if it's you know, profound like this, um, what, what do we have to do in order to reach the other side here and avoid the problems in the existing banking system? Well, I mean, I, I actually think, I mean, you can call me a conservative or a Democrat uh, or a liberal, you know, I'm both because the truth is outside of current politics. Politicians are really fighting inside of a box that the banking system has put them in. So yeah, there's no good solutions. Wow, only five minutes left. Um, yeah, I mean, so there's, there, I, I may come up, came up with eight tools, but fundamentally the thing that has to change inside the Federal Reserve is that you gotta kick the bankers out. The bankers cannot control money supply. Engineers, scientists, mathematicians perhaps, maybe perhaps some, you know, some economists, but basically, a, a new, uh, in the long term, it would have to be a new um, a part of government, a fourth part of government, kind of like the Supreme Court, where engineers and scientists get elected, maybe a lifetime position like the Supreme Court, to go into the Federal Reserve and properly run and construct our society for a uh, sustainable future, for an equitable present where we eliminate poverty. And uh, things like p world peace are possible if the economics are right. Any place in the world where there's peace so, so is because the supply. economics are, are right. The scientists that, and the engineers yeah. who you know, are somehow selected for this would have the power to change money supply and it wouldn't be the bankers anymore. It wouldn't. Am I yeah. right to say it wouldn't be the free market of the bankers anymore? Uh, it would be a, a, a careful plan using the, the best um, engineering and programming principles they can come up with. And it would be centralized in Washington and it would yeah. apply to all the states. Am I right so far? Yeah, we uh, can even keep it in the Eccles building. That's what the Federal Reserve is today in Washington, <laughs> D.C. <laughs> okay, a couple of questions flow out of that. What happens to all the bankers? Uh, are they... Are they going to be employed or unemployed? 
uh, what happens to all the people in the NGOs, you know, and the charitable organizations that help people with this very inefficient system we have now? Are they out of a job? Well, I'm no fan of charities. I don't think charities should exist. So charities are super inefficient, even the best ones. Uh, so, you know, yeah, sorry. If we live in an inefficient economy, you don't need charities. I mean, it's almost by definition. If if this if the society worked correctly, well, then you, you wouldn't need charities. Charities are a solution to uh, a system that doesn't work. And it's a bad solution. This is so, and so is government taking care of people. Uh, banks, banks do actually a, a, a fundamental uh, role, uh, and it's an important role. And that is sometimes you want to borrow money in order to get something done because it's a good idea. Uh, so banks don't go away, but they just don't have this role anymore. And banks could still go to the Federal Reserve to borrow freshly printed money. There isn't a problem with that. The problem is only when it is the only way to get money into the economy. When it's the only way to get money into the economy, you constrain what's possible, and then you wind up having all of these problems, and you wind up not being able to engineer society for a sustainable future. It is, once, once you really get what I'm saying, you, and this is why I wrote these books. And by the way, there's more than one. Your readers can pick this one up for free on Amazon. Optimizing America. That was my first book, my first crack at it. And this okay. is my second one at it. You can also pick this one up for free on some platforms. Um, but the point is, is that once you get this, and once you get dialed into it, how bad our world is today. See what what people don't realize is that as humans, we are so adaptable. We're adaptable to put masks on our face and hide in our houses for years. We're so adaptable. We accept almost anything that's thrown at us. And the truth is, in today's world, society is so bad. It is awful once you look at what's happening. I mean, do you people actually realize that there is a genocide of poverty. Poor people are literally being eliminated globally by the millions every year. And that includes millions of kids too, every year. So if you're poor, you're on the list. I don't want to reference that list, but you get the idea. Poor people are being uh, are being killed off because they don't have enough money. But why well, don't they have enough this, money? Will this solve the problem? Uh, what? Yes, we could, I... we, could, we could solve, we could solve poverty globally, easily nationally and not only that it actually makes us richer our economy will go gangbusters once we gain these efficiencies we'll have more work to do because there's actually infinite work out there you know the only reason why uh, we have trouble with automation taking our jobs and artificial intelligence is because the banking system puts artificial limitations on what work we can do. Once we lose those limitations, there is so much work we can do and we can make this world so much better. Well, let me, let me make me an calm. entrepreneur, okay? I'm an entrepreneur and I want to start a shoe factory. I'm just picking that out of the air. Um, and I, I, need, I don't have the money to start the shoe factory to hire people and build a building and equipment and whatnot. Um, how is the new system going to make it easier for me to build and operate my shoe factory? Well, do you live in America? Uh-huh. Well, I mean, we can say that in today's system, that would be a really bad idea because you're competing against China and Vietnam where people are making a dollar a day or something. And so making shoes over here, unless you have a fully automated uh, um, concept, it would be really not a good idea to build but it. Let's assume place. I do. Let's assume I have a great concept and I have a, a patent on a machine that will make shoes better than anyone else can make them. Let's yeah. assume that. Yeah. Uh, how, how can I start my company in the new system that you're describing? Um, in a better way than the existing system. Well, so the difference would be that in the in in the in the in the in the big solution world, which is what I call it, uh, you are going to have a massive middle class, right? And you're even going to have poor people that have an ability to actually save a little money and actually buy your shoes as well. So the entire market space is much larger, right? Uh, so there's more people buying shoes, new shoes. 
Uh, so th that's that's the potential is that you just you can actually engineer a massive middle class where today you can't. It's just up or down with the with the interest rates. Right. This is this is the lever. We got a hammer and we use it. Ah, so the new it. system, the up or down of the interest rates would not happen. <laughs> the new system, if I go to a banker and I want to make a loan of a million dollars for my shoe factory, uh, I can still get it right except there won't be so many guardrails on it. There won't be so many controls on how I operate. My, I mean, what, what's the difference in the new system in terms well, of my opportunity to, to fund the investment I need? Well, I think fundamentally in the new system, you are definitely gonna have to deal with higher interest rates. And so what, and again, this would be engineered. Today you have almost you're basically zero percent interest rates because in order to grow the economy, we need to keep issuing credit, even if it's for really, really bad purposes, like, uh, you know, I don't know, building a 55 bedroom mansion for Elon Musk because he's the new richest guy in the world. Uh, so. Um, so the, the, the what so what happens is if you start issuing money in other ways than credit, well then a way to restrict the amount of money money in the uh, in the supply is is to raise interest rates permanently. So you would have a permanent higher interest rates. But here's the caveat: now is your shoe company um, totally green? Are those shoes biodegradable? Are they recyclable? Do they have something that makes our society more sustainable than the Chinese shoes or whatever, whatever shoe you want? Does this call? matter in the new system? How it does, does matter because incentivize me to do that. Because in in today's uh, world uh, or in, in banking system, we have one interest rate, and that is also again restricting society for. You know, in that, and so in, 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 in an, an engineered bank or engineered financial system, you would have variable interest rates. So if your shoes are particularly innovative and they are particularly green for the planet, well, then you get a lower interest rate. Now, if you were going to build a uh, tobacco factory for a uh, highly addictive cigarette that is going to be financially uh, sound because of the its addiction rates, well, you might have to pay a much higher interest rates because you're literally costing society uh, uh, some massive medical bills, right? Mm -hmm. So variable interest rates are actually productive if you know where you're going. If you have the like the bank or the current banking system where we have no clue where we're going or how fast our car is going or if there's a wall 10 feet ahead of us, right? Well, then variable interest rates don't make sense because you don't want to pick winners and losers. Well, so this, this will all be delegated to that committee of engineers. Yes, variable interest that, rates that, delegated to engineers. engineers. So that, that would really take a lot off Congress's plate. And I'm not I'm not saying that. Yeah, smaller government. Go, yeah, smaller government. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Much smaller government. And maybe what government, the founding fathers large, intended. Yeah. <laughs> OK, it is no <laughs> doubt about it. We're about out of time, and I and I wanted to uh, ask you one last thing, which I think is very important. Let's assume that I go out and and, and get my hands on both of your books. Let's assume that I three three books, know, three books. Sorry, two uh, well, two of them are free. <laughs> okay, and you know I understand that the banking system is not doing a good job, um, that we have redundancies and inefficiencies uh, all over the lot with our federal system, uh, federal and state system. And I want to rationalize this and make this a, um, you know, a more efficient economy. OK, so um, uh, my name is Jay. I live in Hawaii. What here's my question for you, Charles. What do I do? Where do I go? How do I make this happen? Well, first, it's awareness. I mean, you know, um, you know, if you remember Copernicus or reading about Copernicus, you know, and the planets were round, you know, everybody said, what are you talking about? We're standing on flat ground here and you're saying I'm actually standing on a ball. You're crazy. Well, you know, lots of people talk about Federal Reserve. They're called crazy. And I think, you know, there has been many people who've said, what a weird, mysterious thing the Federal Reserve is. Well, I'm here to tell everybody this is why the Federal Reserve is a 
damned thing right now and it's causing all kinds of trouble and i'm trying to do it in a very simple way that everybody can understand once everybody understand what's going on here and the politicians start picking i believe me even politicians can understand this this is not complicated right so once we get the knowledge out there the information out there start talking to people about it we need to start talking about the federal reserve and the banking system and how to do things properly that's that's the quest. That's why I'm on and do as many uh, uh, you know sh shows as I can. I try to get the word out there, but people do understand this. Um, and um, the so then the they would vote. They would vote for politicians, uh, candidates who would understand it also, and the platform points for those um, politicians, candidates um, would be to modify the banking system, modify the the role of the Federal Reserve, and and um, you know, create a sort of a unified, new, um, engineered, programmed banking system, uh, and that means an awful lot of people would have to get off an awful lot of mm, less rational platforms and and do this. Um, yeah. And, but here's the thing: it this serves conservatives, pure conservatives. Uh, obviously, it can't it can't serve somebody who's completely crazy, but. Uh, but from 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 liberals to conservatives, this serves everyone because this is not inside the box. This is outside of the box thinking, which is obviously what we need. This is an out of the box solution, and with it, utopia is actually possible. World peace, uh, the end of poverty, all of these things are actually possible. And 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 not only that, it will make us wealthier. But the elimination of poverty will make us richer. Um, efficiencies are always yeah. better. There's and huge what efficiencies. What we're talking to be about made. is putting modern science on what do you want to call it? The wing social, of the government. Social science, and right, and uh, and and changing politics. That means changing the en entire structure of, of our country, really. Um, and uh, we got a long way to go. And that road that we have to go down is a political road to change our society. So keep yeah. writing those books, Gerald. Thank we're you, going to need more of them. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank well, you I think much. so. Uh, and I'm waiting for the right opportunity uh, to, to write my next book. Um, but, um, you know, we, we this has to happen. It's, it's not like there's a choice. We literally have a gun to our head. You know, or we're literally driving in a car faster and faster, well over 60 miles an hour, and we will hit something that will end society as we know it. It isn't a matter of if, it is when. And it, it could, I mean, Elon Musk put it, put it at 12 years, and he wants to start a colony on Mars. Well, I've got a better plan. Let's save the planet by just changing one single document, monetary policy. We can literally save the planet and create world peace. It's okay, crazy. we're out of time, Gerald. Thank you very much. Charles Jensen, author, um, and uh, the, the proposition is to examine the international banking system uh, and identify you know, what the problems are and change it. Thank you so much, Charles. Appreciate your, your thoughts and your books and, and your appearance here on Think Tech. Aloha. Thanks. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.